Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new to my channel, hello. My name is Gabby and welcome. So, today's video is about a case that I've known about for probably like a year now and I never thought I was going to do a video on it for one main reason and that is because there's just not a lot of information online about this case but I came across it again last week and I was like, you know what, this case is just too odd for me to not talk about it, so I was determined to find out as much information as I could. So that's what I did, and yeah, that's the case we're going to be talking about today, the case of Tony Danielle Clark, and it's a weird one. So with all that being said, let's just get into it. mysterious case of Tony Danielle Clark. Tony Danielle Clark was born June 4th, 1972. She would be 47 in today's time. She was 17 years old and was a senior in high school. She had black hair and brown eyes. She weighed about 110 pounds and stood 5 feet 3 inches tall. Some distinct physical characteristics of hers were she had a gap between her two front teeth a mole on her left calf, and a scar on her right knee. Her ears were also double pierced. At the time of her disappearance, she was wearing a black tube top trimmed with lace, black linen shorts, a light blue denim jacket, white loafers, and two gold rings on her right hand. She loved to swim, dance, and she ran track on her school track team. She was also two months pregnant. Although she was pregnant at the time of her disappearance, I'm pretty sure she was planning on keeping the baby and she was kind of preparing for being a mother and having to take care of a baby. She still had dreams in life and she wanted to achieve those dreams and some of those were she wanted to be in the Olympics, she wanted to be a swimmer in the Olympics, she was very determined to do that. But if she didn't do that in life, she wanted to be on television in some way. and. Based on the research that I could find about her, she would have been great on TV because she was just very, very outgoing. She had this amazing personality. According to her cousin, every time they went anywhere, somebody recognized her. She was just very, very popular in the area. On March 16th, 1990, Tony was visiting some friends and family in Oakland, California, just over the bridge from San Francisco. This area was known for being an area with a high crime rate. That day, she spent time with loved ones, including her best friend, Najuma, and her cousin, Renee. At the time, she was driving her boyfriend's Chevrolet Camaro, a car she had been having issues with. When she was leaving that night to go back home to San Francisco, the car was having a problem with starting, and it kept stalling, but she decided to make the drive home anyway. As Tony pulled out of the driveway of her cousin's home, her best friend said, Bye, Tony. Give me a call later on tonight. And that was the last time she ever saw her. At some point while driving across the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge, the car stalled out. While the car was on the side of the bridge completely stopped, another car collided with it. The police were called to the scene of the accident and arrived about six minutes later. When they arrived, though, Tony was nowhere to be found, and no one remembered seeing her. The person who hit the car did not remember seeing a female in or around the car when both vehicles collided. There were witness accounts given to the police. A few people remembered driving by the car on the bridge and spotting an African-American male under her car. Others remember seeing this male walking away from her car. None got a good enough view of him to give a solid description though, and it is unclear if these individuals saw this man before or after the accident occurred. When they looked inside the car, there were only two things left in it, and that was the keys in the ignition, and also a bracelet Tony always wore. It was a gold chain bracelet, and it was on the floorboard of the passenger side of the car. Tony's mother, Gwen, said that the bracelet being on the floor and being left in the vehicle was very, very strange because this was a bracelet that Tony never took off. And I've had items of jewelry before in my life that I never took off. And trust me, I never took them off. I think the only time I ever would take them off was when I was like 
baking where I was like kneading bread or if I was going to be doing something like gardening where I'd be getting dirty. So this was known as a bracelet she never took off and the fact that she took it off and it was just laying on the floorboard of the passenger seat struck everybody who knew Tony as very strange. Police initially believed Tony was somehow thrown from the car during the impact, but there was no blood anywhere in the car and the front window of the car was perfectly fine. So police then figured that maybe Tony was standing in front of the car during the impact and she was pushed over the side of the bridge when the crash occurred. The US Coast Guard did a search of the water and they found nothing. No evidence of her or any of her belongings in the water and no one saw a girl get pushed over the side of the bridge that night. The California Highway Patrol stated that based on the current of the water, her body would have drifted towards the Golden Gate Bridge. They did a search through the waters to the Golden Gate Bridge and still nothing. The driver of the other car, the car that collided with Tony's boyfriend's car when they were on the bridge, he was actually tried for vehicular manslaughter, but everything was dropped because there was actually no solid proof that Tony's life had ended that night. Authorities were pretty set on the theory that Tony was somehow pushed off the bridge and that she had floated down the water, but Tony's mother and other members of her family and also friends did not believe this for a second, and there's one main reason for that. A week after the incident, Tony's mother received a phone call, one she would never forget. It was a call that lasted about 40 seconds and was just a young female crying. Gwen believes it was her daughter. She claimed it sounded just like her. A mother would know her daughter's voice. Authorities could not trace the phone call though because of how short it was. One thing happened that really got under Tony's mother's skin, it really irked her and it also confused her, was five days after Tony's disappearance, she started putting up missing persons flyers around San Bruno, California. She was mostly going into stores or on different posts around the streets and just putting up missing flyers about her daughter who was missing and she would go back to these locations and the flyers would be ripped down. Tony's mother had no idea who was ripping down these missing persons flyers. She didn't know if it was possibly the person or people involved in her daughter's disappearance or if it was some kids playing a sick joke or it could have just possibly been somebody who didn't like Tony. Now you have to remember that Tony was really well known around the area and she was very popular, she was very well liked, but even if 99% of people like you, there's always going to be that 1% that doesn't. In 1999, Wesley Shermantine and Lauren Herzog were arrested for taking the lives of multiple people from the mid-1980s to 1999. Shermantine came clean and told police almost everything, including where some of the bodies could be found. When he did this, as a result, Herzog took his own life in 2012. They uncovered as many as six female bodies in different locations. One of the females was supposedly African American, who was pregnant at the time and said to be between 16 to 18 years old when her life was taken. I could not find really any information online though about whether they did a DNA test to see if this woman was in fact Tony. Not much came of this though, but there is still a possibility they could have been involved and Tony's body just has never been located. Chances are Sherman Tyne did not tell authorities every location they hid the bodies of their victims. I could not find much information regarding these men and their connection to this case. It just looks weird that they were targeting an area where Tony disappeared. I couldn't find any information on whether they tested the DNA of the body of the woman who was African American and pregnant. I really don't think that they tested the DNA of the body because I'm sure it would have came out to the public that it wasn't Tony's remains. It just is weird that this is basically the perfect description of Tony. She was African American, she was 17, which is right in between 16 to 18. She was pregnant. I mean, it's around the same area. It could have been her. I can't say it was, but 
I hope if the DNA was not tested already that it will be in the future. Well, for 29 years now, almost three decades, Tony's family has no idea what exactly happened to her. Was she pushed over the bridge? Was she abducted? Did police focus too much on the accident and not enough on there possibly being foul play involved? Who was the man seen under the Camaro? Why was her bracelet left on the floorboard of the passenger's side of the car? They have been trying for years to piece together everything, but according to them, the police never took this case too seriously. Even though this is considered a missing persons case, most officers just figure she was pushed off the bridge by the car. No matter what, her family is hurt. It never received more attention, like many other cases do. Newspapers never wrote much about it, and people didn't pay much attention to it. They want answers and believe someone out there knows something. And if you do, you are urged to call the San Bruno Police Department at 650-616-7100. You can stay anonymous. This is a case that definitely deserves to be solved and I hope someday it can be. Now is the part of the video where I kind of dive into some of my final thoughts and my theories regarding the case. If you do not want to hear my personal opinions when it comes to the case we just discussed, you can completely skip over this part of the video. There's a few things that I keep coming back to with this case. The first thing is definitely the bracelet. I myself have had items of jewelry that I never take off, but there are some circumstances where I do take them off. and. One of those circumstances would be if I knew I was going to get dirty, like going under the hood of a vehicle to check out the engine. This is quite possibly what happened. Maybe she knew she was going to get out of the car and check under the hood, so she took off her bracelet and sat it down in the passenger seat. And when the other car collided with the car, it probably knocked off onto the floorboard. I honestly personally think that this is what happened if I had to make a solid guess about the entire thing with the bracelet and it being left in the vehicle. There are some people though that think it was kind of a sign that Tony was being abducted, that somebody was trying to take her, and in her mind she thought, okay, I have to let everybody know and the people who love me know that something happened, that something very bad happened to me. So I'm going to take off an item of jewelry that I never, never take off and leave it in the car, toss it down so they know that something had happened. When you think about it, this does make perfect sense, but me personally, I kind of do lean towards the first theory more than the second. The second thing is the unknown man who was seen around her vehicle, who was seen under her vehicle, who was seen walking away from it. It's just very weird because nobody saw Tony with this man. That's what doesn't make sense. It could 100% look like an abduction if somebody had seen her with this man as well, but he was just a lone man checking out her car. There were some people online that said that maybe since it was late at night and people were driving by quite quickly that somebody saw Tony under the car and Tony walking away from the car and thought that it was a guy. Now, there was too many people that said that it was definitely a man, so I don't really know what to think of this theory. It definitely is a possibility, but there is a chance that she left the vehicle to go get help and then somebody came by and saw that the car had stalled out and tried to look at it themselves, but why would she have walked away from the car to go get help and left the keys in the car? There was one tiny theory that I came across on one post on Reddit. I didn't see it anywhere else, but somebody came up with a good theory. It's a little far-fetched, but nothing's impossible when it comes to cold cases. I've heard some insane things, but they said maybe before she got to the bridge, there were two men or three men or however many people, women, who knows, who were looking to abduct somebody. Maybe their plan was to abduct the person out of a car and one of the people in the vehicle take their car, the car of the person they just abducted, and drive off with it. That would kind of make sense. I mean, if she was abducted, put into another vehicle, one of the people in that vehicle took over her vehicle and drove off with it and they were all gonna meet up at the end. And then this person who took her vehicle was driving off 
and it stalled out, not knowing that she was having issues with the car. Maybe it was the man who was seen under her car and walking away from the car and he had stalled out after she was abducted and was checking around to see if he could get it fixed and then just left the scene and then a car crash happened and somebody collided with the back. It's not impossible. I mean, it's a very in detailed theory, but it could have happened. Tony's mother said, I don't care what anyone says, what anyone does, I am never giving up looking for my baby. I think she was abducted by someone wacko. Last thing is the phone call. Now, if you watch a lot of my videos, even the last one I just did, people calling the families and pretending to be the victims is not uncommon with cases. And it's disgusting, it's horrible, I don't understand how people can do that, but it is something that happens. There is a possibility that somebody called her mother and it was a complete joke. Now I know the missing person flyers were put up five days after Tony's disappearance and the call was made about a week after, so that would give you a few days. So there is a possibility that somebody saw the missing person flyers and got the number from there and then called her mother pretending to be her. But you have to think that a mother would know her daughter's cry. I feel like you would know if it was your child on the other end of the phone line crying, but you never know because there's been so many parents that have said that they swear up and down that the person on the phone was their child and then it's traced back to a house and they find out that it wasn't. Tony's mother though says that she knows 100% that it was her daughter's cry. So if it was her daughter on the other end of the phone, maybe her abductor let her call her mother one last time and knowing that it could be traced, they cut it off before it could be. Tony's best friend does have a good point when she talks about Tony's case. She said that she never understood why this case was not taken more seriously by police, especially in 2002 when the Lacey Peterson case happened and she had disappeared for a period of time before her remains were found. And that case just blew up and everybody knew about it. And she was pregnant, she was a young woman, but that's not what happened with Tony's case. It was definitely just pushed under the rug. She says that she just wishes that Tony's case got the same amount of attention that other cases did. And it's really sad that it didn't because police kind of just wrote it off as, oh, well, she was pushed over the bridge, even though there was no evidence that she was. If you were pushed over the bridge, don't you think there would be some sort of indent in the front of the car? or some blood or hair or something on the side of the bridge, there wasn't. Even though both circumstances are absolutely heartbreaking to think about, whether it's her being pushed over the bridge and ultimately drowning or hitting her head on something or her being abducted, both are horrible, but you would more want her to have lost her life from being pushed over a bridge than being abducted and not knowing the horrible, disgusting things that could have happened to her. And people do want to hope that she was simply just pushed over the bridge and that her life ended that way. But something tells people who research into this case that that's not what happened, that she was abducted. I hope there is a resolution to this case one day. I hope there's a resolution to every case that I talk about, but there's just something extra weird about this case that you kind of just want to be like, okay, well maybe she was pushed over the bridge, but something tells you that she wasn't. Also, you have to remember that this was a very rough neighborhood. And another thing that I also thought about is that a young woman would have definitely brought her purse with her if she was going out for the day to visit family or friends, even though you may not need your money or your ID or anything, you would still kind of bring your purse just because we always have it on us. And from what I could find about this case, they didn't find her purse in the car, which to me obviously also makes it look like an abduction. But like always, let me know your opinions down below in the comments. Your comments seriously get me thinking and they also get the family members of the victims thinking. I get a lot of comments and emails from family members telling me that they 
floated through the comments on my video and they saw a lot of amazing comments from my subscribers about theories that they didn't even think of themselves. Always make sure to leave your opinions down below in the comments if you have any because you never know what could come of it. And with all that being said, if you're not already subscribed to my channel, make sure to do that and like this video because it really helps your girl out. And I will see you guys in the next one. Bye guys.